Um, so welcome everybody. Uh, I'm very pleased to um, introduce our next speaker, who's uh, Thomas Covin. And um, I'll say a few words about Thomas and his work uh, before we begin his um, talk on uh, public history challenges. So um, Thomas is an associate professor of public history uh, of the University of Luxembourg. Um, he got his PhD from the European University Institute in uh, 2012 and uh, has since then been a postdoc and then an assistant professor in uh, the US. Now he's um, back in Europe at the University of Luxembourg and he is, um, he's just won a big grant, uh, so kind of grant Congratulations on that um, from the Luxembourg um, National Research Fund. And um, between 2020 and, two th and 2025, he's going to work on a project um, where he wants to um, develop historical practices uh, in public and digital spaces to include and empower and engage public groups in um, critical debates on contemporary history while maintaining uh, ethical and methodological um, standards. So that sounds very, very exciting. Um, and Thomas has also authored a um, monograph, uh, uh, which is called, he's the author of um, Public History, a textbook of um, practice, um, which I can recommend. <laughs> and um, so Thomas is going to talk about, um, to us about um, public history challenges. So a warm welcome, Thomas. Uh, we're very happy to have you here to talk to us in Wagnet. Thank you, Ellie. Can you all uh, hear me well? Yeah. All right. Uh, good. Good. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm very, very pleased to be with you this morning. Uh, thank you so much for for the invitation. Um, and uh, as Ellie just said, I I'm interested in uh, public history. And before I forgot, I need to share my screen. So that that's important because uh, I prepared a few slides. Um, you can add, let me know if that works. Um, it should be, um, all right, can you just- yes. uh, we see yeah. your screen, yep. Okay. So uh, as the, the title says, I'm interested in public history, um, which you know, uh, is based on, on two main aspects, communicating history to large audiences, and the second aspect, which is more challenging, is doing uh, history together, participatory practices. And this is uh, what I'm interested in, and this is what I would like to focus on this, this morning. Um, so I, I'm starting a project called Public History as the New Citizen Science of the Past, in which I'm thinking, I'm reporting on uh, participatory frameworks to do history uh, with partners with groups. Uh, and I'm starting this project, as Ellis said, at, at the Center for uh, Contemporary and Digital History in, in Luxembourg. And part of this project, uh, so it's, it's a wide and, and large project uh, um, for which I'm working with, with museums, with universities, centers, and so on. And part of this project also uh, focuses on um, archiving. I'm not an archivist, and uh, actually I know more about, about museums than archives, but there's one aspect in archiving that I, I, I am very interested in, that's the public dimension, the public perspective. And with the uh, International Federation for Public History, with whom uh, I've been part for, for a few years, we, uh, for example, started to map a project that document uh, and archives COVID-19 uh, data and, and memories. So you, you partly have the map here on, on the slide and I can, uh, I would be happy to share the, the, the map with you. The, the reason is that uh, for most of these projects are public projects. And I'm personally interested in, in understanding what's the, the role of public users in, uh, in those projects, in archiving about COVID-19 uh, memories. The map has more than 550 projects, so it's not exhaustive, but it's pretty solid map. And this is a, a database that we want to use to study um, how museums, archives, libraries collect and use and give a, 
give power to public users in making uh, those collections. So um, uh, some, some, some questions that I want to address today, I probably have more questions than, than answers as, as usual, but I think those projects archiving with the public trigger a uh, lot of questions for uh, historians, archivists, and public engagement. So the, the, the first I mentioned that I want to uh, deal with is uh, archiving and public engagement in times of crisis. So in this period of COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I don't know if you can uh, see, uh, well, yeah, I just need to, uh, yeah. Uh, so crisis, temporary, and history. Uh, there is we, we're in the you know difficult time, difficult context, uh, and and this affect I believe the the perception of time that that we have. This is a, a, a quote from a, a project in Australia about COVID nineteen memories that says we are living in extraordinary times. Uh, Australians, uh, every thousand Australians is experiencing a truly global history making event. So there is this perception that we are going through historical uh, event. And this has an impact on the, the, the job, on the role of historians, archivists, and other cultural institutions. How does that impact what we do and uh, what we want to do? Uh, just have to move. Uh, just one example is a, a well, recent, relatively recent quote from uh, the International Council on Archives in April, who said that during the COVID-19, the duty to document does not cease. It becomes more essential. So the, the, the crisis or our perception of the crisis forced us to rethink about what we're doing. Rethink about the process of, of doing history, collecting archives. And I think this is, this is not a, a new uh, phenomenon. Uh, crisis force us to reflect about our job. Uh, one quote on, on the left hand side of the slide is from a, a recent uh, project that archived COVID-19 memories, the Journal of the Plague Year, that says, uh, archiving presents innumerable ways to include and unfortunately exclude people. It's an overview of what we're doing to recognize and reduce silences in the archives. And silences is, is important. It's not, again, it's not, a new, um, it's not a new idea. It's not a new phenomenon. It's something that's been greatly studied by uh, Michel Rolf Trujillo in his book about silencing the past, in which you may be familiar with the book. It details the different steps in which we create silences. And archiving is one of the major steps in which we create silences because, because of the selection. Right? And I think that this uh, context of COVID-19 forced us to think about uh, how we archive, how we do history, whom we're silencing, and, and, and why we're silencing those people. And this, this um, project of studying COVID-19 memory project is part of a bigger project in which I want to study archives of tragedies in the digital age. So I, I want to focus this few next few slides about participatory project of collecting uh, about tragedies. It uh, collecting about tragedy, and I will talk later about what tragedies we're talking about. It is part of a, a, a broader trend of rapid response collecting in which cultural institutions, museums, archives, libraries have collected about current situation. This is a slide from the Virginia Alberts Museum, which is pretty much the museum that you know, came up with the, the rapid response collecting uh, ID. Well, not ID, but terms, right? And my, uh, my question is to see how rapid response collecting was done digitally since uh, the, two, the year 2000s. Talking about tragedies, uh, memorials of tragedies are obviously not new. And I just trace uh, and I just give you a few examples from the US where, where I was working, like the, the death of John Lennon in 1980, uh, the World Trade Center, the Oklahoma City bombing. And the last one that I mentioned, Little Town, Colorado, where you had a, 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 
a shooting uh, in 1999. And during those events, people were just dropping items, teddy bears, flowers. You see on the, on the, on the, on the, on the photographs here, people bringing uh, memorabilia for the little town Colorado uh, shooting in 1999. And this was an important event in, in collecting because in 1999, the Museum of the Town of Littleton decided to collect everything that people you know, brought to the, to the theme. So rapid response collecting in 1999 by a museum, right? But it was done physically, right? They were collecting all the, the flowers, items, and so on. What changed in the year 2000 was that this rapid response collecting uh, started to be done uh, digitally. And this is what I'm studying, how projects uh, started to collect and create archives of tragedy using digital tools. The, well, I guess the most famous example and the, perhaps the first uh, digital collecting archive that I'm studying is the September 11 digital archives that has become like a model for other projects. When I talk to uh, leaders of, of project of COVID-19 uh, memory project or previous ones that I will mention later, the digital, uh, the September 11 digital archives is, is the model that they wanna follow for, for some reasons. First, because it was the, one of the first project to do so. And uh, my idea is to study how the digital collecting uh, involved, has involved uh, with what role the, the public and the public users. So this is the first example that I'm, I'm collecting and studying, but we have many different uh, digital archives of, of tragedy. Uh, I just mentioned here on the right hand side, the uh, Katrina archives, which is called the Hurricane Digital Memory Bank about the Hurricane Katrina in Louisiana which was the, in 2006. But you have also uh, the Boston Marathon, uh, upper left, or uh, examples in, um, in Japan, uh, bottom left, about uh, the, the, the earthquake. You have example in New Zealand, you have example in terrorist attacks all over the world. So what I'm studying and what I want to study is the role of the public in creating those uh, digital archives. So the question, because as I said, there are many questions um, about archiving together, archiving the past. What's the public dimension of archiving together? And what does that mean for those projects? So the questions are not only about the new role of archivist, but the new role of public history, how to make public history with people, what ethical issues does that raise? Um, how to do so, how to create a framework in which uh, archivists, historians, curators are collaborating with community, with users and other partners. And archivists have obviously started to uh, think about the, the project. I'm mentioning just this toolkit that was established in 2018, but arch uh, archivists documenting uh, in times of crisis. So it, it, it was a two year, I believe a two year um, research project to, that came up with a, a toolkit about tips and guidelines to document and create archives during times of crisis. And as I say, it triggers a few examples and a few questions. Uh, the first one is what events should be archived? And this goes back to the old discussion about uh, neutrality of museums and archives that has been discussed in the past few years. Choosing an event to archive an event, be it the, the COVID-19 uh, memory project or more controversially, the, the Black Lives Matter archives. Choosing one event to archive tells already something about choice made by the, the library, by the museum, by the, the archives. And there's been some uh, discussion in the UK in the last few months about uh, cultural institutions, museums, archives, 
who want to um, show the, the slavery past of the UK. So deciding to collect not only about Black Lives Matters, but about monuments and about the, the, the racial history of, uh, of the UK. And this has triggered some reaction also from users, from people saying my archive, my national archive in the UK is not supposed to focus on the dark past, but to be more celebratory about uh, our glorious past. So deciding what to archive, Black Lives Matter or not, um, triggers some discussion about what's the public aspect, what's the public uh, perspective of the archive, of the library, of the museum. Another question about um, archiving or not archiving, right? When, um, when to collect about a tragedy, when to collect about a, a difficult event, because archivists, historians who collect uh, documents, memories about a tragedy, turn the archives into a memorial, right? And this is something that um, the, the post-archive people in uh, Orlando, Florida, you may remember there was a, a shooting in a nightclub uh, in 2016 in Orlando, a uh, gay lesbian uh, nightclub. And there was, there, there is this project of archiving um, documents, data about, about the event. And what the, the, the leaders of the project said is that within a month, within a month, we created an online memorial for the artifact and photographs connected to families and grieving nations. So they, they, they have this understanding that their archives is also an online memorial, right? And if you conceive your archive as a memorial, you trigger some new questions about uh, trauma, about memories, about grief, which is very specific to uh, archiving tragedy. And this has raised some criticism. Uh, for example, this is a, a, a blog post from Era Tensei about a trauma, the fact that archivists, historians, and others who collect documents about a tragedy rears trauma. Uh, I, I quote her about Katrina, and she said that I think there was a deep fatigue around the expectation of telling and retelling Katrina, so the, the hurricane in tw uh, 2006. Stories to outsiders. Also the relation between archivists and collectors as outsiders of the community. It was as if the stories of trauma had become a commodity, right? So some people felt used by people who archives uh, their memories. So there is this you know, problem, this, this question about archiving tragedy. And this is again, not, not something new. Marita Sturkin uh, in 2007 uh, mentioned collecting as a cultural reenactment of trauma. When you collect, you reenact trauma and people going through archives may go through again uh, the, the, the tragedy. So there is this you know, traumatic issue that people have started to, uh, to, um, to challenge. So the question is, when is it too soon to, uh, to archive about a tragedy? And um, about the 9-11 the, the archives, that was one of the first digital archives collected with uh, the public. Gardner and Henry from the Smithsonian Museum said uh, a few months after they started the archives that we are still too close to the events to be able to judge clearly what is truly historically important, right? So it's not only about collecting everything, it's about deciding what's truly historical. And they said that it was too soon for the digital uh, and September 11 archives, right? They couldn't select what uh, was truly historical. So there is the question about the trauma. There is also the question about when it is too soon in terms of perspective, historical perspective. Another type of public question is uh, about representativity and silences. What's the public dimension of the archives? Because as we said, uh, in time of crisis, we have a reflection about what we're doing, what silences are we creating? What publics are we forgetting? Or what publics are not included in the archives in this self-reflection? There have been a few, a few articles about silences in the archives. I just mentioned uh, this one from 06 
power archival sciences and, and power in silence. Because as, as, as he said, total archives do not exist, uh, exist sorry. And that triggers some reflection from, from digital archive project. This is a, a quote from a, a 2020 uh, COVID-19 memory project, the Journal of the Plague Year, that says uh, with the, the global nature of the archives, that is digital, there's a potential, an increased potential for silences, right? Uh, archival sciences favor those with power and resources. And this is interesting because that's an ongoing project. This project is, is uh, still on. It started uh, like five, six months ago. And they're already thinking about what they're doing, this self-reflection about power, resources, whom are we silencing, um, and how to uh, overcome that silence. Other project have decided like the, the Corona Archive in Germany, which is the, the biggest COVID-19 uh, archiving project in Germany. They, they said they wanna collect everything, again, to, uh, to fight silences. They say uh, it can include anything that is available in a digital or digitizable uh, format, text, photographs, drawing, videos, social media posts, and so on. So they, they have this wish to fight silencing, to collect every type of format, right? Doesn't mean that every kind of, of categories or committees are involved, but the, every format are collected in a, in a wish to be uh, more representative. Other uh, projects like the Vitrine en Confinement, which is a, a French project, have archived uh, everyday objects or everyday situations, or in that case, everyday uh, shop uh, windows. So this is another example of we want to avoid silencing aspects of our society that were previously silenced, like everyday objects, like everyday shops, stores, and so on. So again, in a way to fight silences and to be more representative, to be more public. And they have this uh, self-reflection about silences. They are very aware of what they're doing. Uh, as as uh, Carmen McKendrick said, if we, you know, so much as a silence, we have already destroyed. If you identify silences, you already try to fill the void. So that's what I, I think the, those projects are doing, thinking about their public, thinking about publics, and thinking about what communities, people, they may be forgetting. And when you, you identify silences, you try to uh, fill the void. This is an example from uh, the UK, the national, sorry for the poor quality of the slide, the National Trust in the UK a few years ago that identified loopholes in terms of uh, sexual minorities in their collection, uh, in that case, gay and, and lesbians. So they were trying to fill that void by collecting more about, about uh, these communities in the UK because they had identified silences. Other projects like my colleagues at the University of Luxembourg identified communities that were not part of the initial uh, memory project, in that case, the, the health workers. So they organized all history of this specific category, the health worker. So identifying silences and being proactive in enriching the archives. So you can do it by new types of topics or by all history, historians and archivists being more proactive. But the true question uh, that I'm interested in is, is the power relation. It's not only about the representativity of the archives, but also about the decision making, who decides what the archives will be, who decides what the, the, the collection will be. And this is, I think, a very important um, aspect of the discussion. Um, Ellie, may I just ask how I'm doing in terms of, of timing? Um, so there's uh, five, seven minutes left. So that is that. That's and that's I, great. Yeah. I will go with okay. the seven minutes. OK, I guess. <laughs> um, so the, the public aspect, the public perspective of archives. There are a few, uh, a few ways that this has been dealt with. 
One is for specific groups to create their own archives. The example I chose were uh, women's archives in, in Canada, fighting what they call the patriarchives. So having their own archives, uh, the women's movement archive or the Canadian, Canadian lesbian and gay archives, they want to combat silences from the state archives. So what they do is to create their own archives, their own record they, that they can control. Again, in, in, a, in, a, in a process of uh, fighting silences and to create more, let's say, more public archives and center they're more representative. Sorry, I need to move it there. Other projects have uh, identified silences and I've worked at the origin of the project with communities. So they create archives working directly with the communities that they have, uh, they have contacted before. This is an example of, of a COVID-19 archive project called the Pandemic Religion, a digital archives, which is about religious experiences and religions during the time of the COVID-19. And this specific subsection was uh, done in collaboration with different research centers like the uh, Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media and some Jewish communities. So working together to, from the, from, from the start, create community archives. Uh, and I will go back to this, uh, to this project because I think it triggers some very important discussion about uh, working with communities and giving voice to communities in archiving um, about the pandemic. And, and community archives have been seen as one way to um, fight silences, right? This is a, a famous uh, chapter and book about uh, solutions to the silence on, on the right hand side, published in 2017. And one solution uh, to fight silences in archive was to work from, from the beginning with uh, community and to create community archives to add to uh, the other aspects of, of the archives. And what I think is, is, uh, is very interesting is when um, archives or the selection uh, is done by users. And this is what I want to focus the, the, the remaining part of my, of my talk on digital archives controlled by public users, still working on, on tragedy and, and, and the pandemic, which is a very specific way of archiving because, uh, because of the speed of the decision making. How, who decides what to be collected, what to be stored in this time of, uh, of tragedy? So the power of people in uh, collecting and creating archives. And there are a few, uh, there are a few issues in people uh, collecting archives and people selecting archives. Just uh, one example about identity and privacy, which is a big ethical issue for these digital archives. You have two, you have two different uh, aspects. The Hurricane Memory Bank, so about the Hurricane Katrina in 06 uh, decided to include anonymity and the option for people to submit their story just for researchers. So their story may not be fully accessible and available online. They wanted to give uh, power to the public, to the users uh, in the creation of the archives. So if they wanted, if the user wanted to keep and stay private, they could. Uh, the Journal of the Plague Year in 2020, so it's a current project, says that uh, there's another issue. When contributors want to be anonymous, right, they also have to make sure that their data remain anonymous, right? Because you, there, are all, there are ways, geographic ways and other ways to find identity or to uh, lose this anonymity. So, Again, this ethical discussion is something they're doing about their archives, uh, right when they create the archives. There's also the issue of controlling the data. As we said, they may, people may want to you know, stay private. Um, they also, for the Hurricane Memory Bank in, in 2006, kept the control over the, the data, right? 
they could they, the the data and the, the archives could not be used without the consent of uh, of the users. So the power of the users was very important on the creation on the on the sustainability of the archives. The consent and copyrights remain in the hands of the users, which again raises some question about uh, the the preservation of the archives and the use of the archives later for exhibitions for a um, website and so on. And the question about making those digital archives available online, because most of the, those archives are directly accessible and available. There are some uh, difficult documents, sensitive images or documents, for example, for the Pulse in 2016. So what is available online and who decide what should be available online? Uh, for, for the Pulse. Or for 2020, the Corner Archives, a big part of what they collected was uh, also about racism, about hatred, especially in the first few uh, weeks and months of the Corona Archives, uh, the, of the Corona virus. So the decision was, what do we make available online? Uh, should we have hatred comments and, and racist comment online? They definitely kept those comments in the archives, but do they make them available online in the web uh, on the web platform? That's that's another discussion. Uh, again, I passed on, on that one uh, because I, I think I want to uh, say a few things about the metadata. Another way to increase the public participation is to give control of the, the metadata, so the interoperability with other collecting projects. In the first few years, in 2001, 2006, uh, those projects use uh, traditional standards, uh, Dublin Core and so on. They didn't give access, they didn't give control to the metadata for, to the users because they wanted to protect the data, right? They wanted to protect and they wanted to avoid people tagging each others for some uh, privacy issues. So this was all six. On the opposite, the Journal of the Plague Year, which is a 2020 project, is trying to um, allow users to tag each other in the, this folksonomic tagging based on the, the Flickr model. So what they want is to give power to people to use uh, hashtag and other types of tagging to create uh, and to enrich the metadata. As they say, empowering the public to create their own vocabulary. And this raises some discussion and question about the role of the, the archivist and other people in charge of the of the of, of you know the folksonomy and people adding their own terms and, and sometimes uh, using different words for the same um, same events or same meaning uh, is one of their their problems. But two different ways of giving power to the public in uh, using that app. Uh, I will finish with uh, what I think are a few risks for those projects collecting about tragedy. One is the fragmentation of, of, the, uh, of the archives. This is the, the, the digital archives about the Barcelona attack in 2017. And they came up with a, a website, this is a screenshot, of uh, individual memories uh, of the attack. And as you can see, this mosaic, that, that's great, but also it's a, it's a complete fragmentation of the event. And that there's always this question about how um, future people will interpret and use those archives with this mosaic fragmentation of, uh, of ego document, because each document is an ego document. Each document, photographs, letters is about a personal feeling, personal experience of the attack of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So we collect ego document, but only ego document, right? And, and those projects reinforce the very personal uh, understanding of the COVID-19 of the personal attack. So are we losing broader, uh, broader interpretation of those events? Are we fragmenting the events? There is very few. There are very few projects that collect COVID nineteen memories beyond the town, beyond uh, the country. Right? There are uh, just a few that are international. Most of COVID nineteen archives are very local. 
right? So we, we have this fragmentation of local memories of something which is pretty global. Uh, I'm not saying the experience are the same in the US, in Mexico, Brazil, or France, but there is a global discussion. And those global discussions are not archived in those local uh, projects. This is only one of the few examples that try to go beyond the nation. This is the House of European History uh, COVID-19 projects. Uh, but again, they are using different examples from different countries. They're not bringing, they're not archiving this European dimension of the COVID-19. And last, this is the final um, question. Uh, there is, I think, a risk of people confusing uh, archives testimonies and history. This is a quote from the pandemic religion archives. Someone who said, uh, I quote, that means that history isn't the exclusive preserve of anybody. I would tend to agree, but he, he keeps saying it's all there. If you want to learn about how the American Jewish community responded to the ongoing COVID-19 crisis, just take a look, right? It's like, it's history. Well, not really. I wouldn't say that uh, the documents collected are history. There's a confusion between a, a document and history. These participatory practices, this democratization of collecting may trigger this feeling that, you know, we all have different interpretation and it's all history. We, we miss the, the process of doing history, which is, you know, analyzing sources, contextualizing, comparing. I think there is a risk of confusion between testimonies uh, and, and history right there, All right? So to, to conclude, I, I think this, this situation and the crisis situation forced historians, in, in my case, public historians, to rethink about how we work, how we create history, how people can participate to the production of history and what framework can be used to make history together, the limits of making history together or the ethical issues of making history together. Uh, so I, I, I think this digital public history, do digital public history projects are a very good example of what we can do and how we should reinvent our role of historian, archivists or curators in the digital uh, realm. So thank you for your attention. I, I hope I was I was in pretty much sticking to time, and I'm looking forward to uh, comments or questions you may have. Uh, so thank thank you so much, um, Thomas, uh, for a really fascinating topic uh, talk um, on a topic that's very close to I think many of us and what we do and um, to the network as such. Um, and there, I can see, the, so I'm watching the chat as well, um, and there are many comments and questions. Um, so you definitely engaged your audience a lot. And um, so I think, um, well, some are just comments, um, but I'll start with the questions. Um, so I think the first question that I see is from um, Nils Bricker from um, 9.52. To, um, so Nils, do you just do you, do you want to unmute and, and ask the question um, uh, about um, a digital media question? Um, yes, yeah. I can do that. Uh, okay. <clears throat> yeah, as, as I put it in the question, it, it sounds a little bit to me as if you want to talk about something new that's happening now. You talked about uh, the, what did you call it? Uh, yeah, the archives of tragedies in digital life. But uh, uh, to me, uh, the digital life tend to appear in your in your lecture in a way, because you just you, you just talk about it, which is fine, but you don't apparently don't have much much to say about what is the specific specificities of this digital life. I mean, what what are what's the difference between what what happened with the, you mentioned John Lennon and that, uh, and what happens now? I mean, and, and in that you have a sort of an embedded uh, media historical uh, thing kind of roaming around, which which I do not think is kind of um, unfolded enough in, in your in your lecture. So if you could expand a little bit on that. Sure, yeah, let me just mute myself. Yes, thank you, thank you for, for the question. Um, 
Yeah, I guess I guess you, you you're right. I, I I didn't explain enough the the shift or what I what what's what's new with digital uh, collecting processes. Um, for example, uh, John Lennon memorials or the bowling for for Columbine. Um, those 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 items were not first meant to be collected. People just drop a, a teddy bear or or um, brought brought flowers. For the digital archive project, uh, those contents were collected as archives. So people were asked to create archives to to send uh, things that they want to be preserved. So. There's a first shift uh, for, for John Lennon. People were not asked to create an archive about John Lennon, but the 9-11 the or the Manchester uh, shooting attack in, in 2017, uh, archivists, historians, and other uh, librarians ask people to select what they want to uh, preserve about, about the, the, the topic. So I think there is something new here. Um, the format is also very new. Uh, people can uh, submit uh, tweets, they can submit uh, photographs, something that you didn't really have for, for um, you know, obviously John Lennon or, or the Oklahoma, Oklahoma uh, bombing attacks. Social media is also becoming much more important in what archivists want to uh, collect. So this is again something quite uh, different. Then you have some projects, and we, I'm sure we can talk about that because I feel for comments about uh, that, that ask people to um, tag each other or to select from the archives what they want to preserve and what they want to collect. So you have a direct, well, direct, you have a communication between uh, the, the leaders of the project and the communities and the people who you know, drop things or, or, or send things that you didn't have for memorials before that were simply stuff collected by the archivist on site, uh, like at the church of 9-11, uh, archivists went there and, and, and collected stuff, which is slightly different, I believe, from, uh, from the digital projects in which we have a, an archiving projects uh, acknowledged and, and, and mentioned by the, the leaders. Not sure, does that answer? Uh, no, no. In fact, it does not. <laughs> Sorry, but no. But uh, because uh, the question about if people are asked to deliver it or hand it over to the archiving institution does not have anything to do with the digital. I mean, you could have have had that as well uh, at the time of John Lennon. I mean, they could just have done that. People would have handed it over and put it at the museum or whatever. So it it doesn't kind of tell us anything about what is the specific specificities of the digital and you in a way touched upon it because you mentioned the the rapid response uh, thing i don't remember the last uh, part of the name so that that's one thing that is important with the digital the speed so it's much more easy it's much more quick etc cetera, etc cetera. so it, there is some sort of uh, easiness uh, for handing over things mm -hmm. uh, but you could also have turned it a little bit around because uh, on the web, at least, and many in social media as well, people were, were doing a lot of stuff in, in, in relation to 9-11 and, and the, the, the later events that was not asked for by any archiving institution as well. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's also something that people do in, uh, by themselves uh, related to an event. Yeah, but I think we should just move on to, to the next questions. All right. Um, so I see. Um, well, so uh, maybe I just read the next question. The next question is from uh, Valérie. Uh, and it's, um, I would like to hear about the archiving institution, uh, about this fragmentation of memories and traces. Is it an asset, um, something that they try to follow and take into account, or may, may become a real challenge and weaken the collective effort uh, they are providing? Thank you, Valerie. Um, Valerie, do you want to say something? Yeah, yes, uh, yeah just, just to explain a bit more, I was thinking about, uh, for example, this uh, tribune in Liberation, where some researcher says, OK, we have to preserve the COVID memories. And then, for example, BNF and others answer, but we are doing this. So please just also keep in mind that there are professionals who are acting and who are 
uh, creating collections. And so it was a question uh, for Thomas, but also for uh, the web archiving institutions that are there or uh, the web archiving that are present to know how they deal with it because this fragmentation may also weaken what they are doing or it, uh, do they monitor it? So it's a collective question, I would say. <laughs> Yes, because I don't have the answer. <laughs> um, uh, part of what I'd like to do and, and others uh, as well is to interview uh, and, 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 uh, and, and study the, the ethical issues and the decisions that are made by, by the, the archive libraries and, and museums. Um, I'm not exactly sure what they think about the fragmentation or if they think about the fragmentation. It's just something that I, uh, appeared to me when uh, looking at the documents collected by 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 the institutions, uh, museums, and and so on, and the over emphasis on obviously personal feeling because that's how they designed the, the collecting process. We want your personal experience about COVID nineteen, about nine eleven, about about uh, you know the earthquake. So this is just uh, uh, um, an idea and and and. A, to evaluate the, the impact of this way of collecting and the, the emphasis on personal feeling, something that you mentioned, uh, I think it was you, Valérie, the, the, the selfie uh, ID of, 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 the, of the archives and, and how people obviously deliver and give their personal interpretation, but what about the people who will use those archives? Uh, they will, uh, Will they reproduce and, and, and study the personal feelings and having a fragmentation, not having archives or materials that connect each other? Um, this is, I think, important for how the, the archives and the materials will, will be used in exhibitions in, in further projects. So I don't have the answer, but that's definitely something I'd like to study in how they use the archives and, and the end of project uh, product. Um, excellent. Um, so, um, so there, there is a comment from from Niels, but I will skip that because, well, Niels has already spoken. Well, so chairing becomes much more of a public thing because you can see how I, <laughs> how I actually select your comments. Um, um, but, um, but there is a comment from uh, Sharon. Um, Sharon, do you want to add that comment? Yeah, I, I'm very interested in the, the oral history side of uh, collecting tragedies and also conflicts uh, in terms of uh, forgiveness and reconciliation. Um, and the project in particular in Ireland uh, on oral history collecting that was meant to be um, archived and, and kept secret more or less in a dark archive until the person who'd given the interview had passed away or until their family had uh, said, okay, that's fine, that can be released. And due to, the, the interviews were done around 2001. And after that, um, there was a treaty came in with um, the US and the UK um, on kind of an international crime treaty. And through that, uh, the interviews were up for grabs, really, uh, in a way that they ended up in a legal wrangle. Um, the, I do believe that the interviewers, uh, the, the, the people who, who, who organised the project and so on, ha really had the best of intentions to archive um, and to find closure for victims, even though uh, they may be not in this generation, but to find out where people were buried, uh, people who had been killed, um, who had killed them and why and so on and so forth. And it wasn't just, it was very mixed up um, for a number of years as into how these interviews, would they remain secret and would they not? And ended up some of them didn't. Um, and I think we need to remember that when we're, we're building these type of uh, tragedy or conflict archives that um, the legalities uh, across borders are problematic that if you're going to interview, uh, you know, in one, one, one country, as we said, let's say it's in the context of the, the, the United States and the UK then had a, um, you know, a treaty with the US and those um, interviews were, um, you know, able to be exposed. So we need probably in oral history, there was a, a vast uh, amount of training done in Ireland and the UK then around the oral history and these types of interviews. And it's not really, uh, you know, it's not really 
kind of sacrosanct in a way, it's only guidelines. There are no, you know, fail safes in, in these instances. Uh, um, and especially I think with tragedy and conflict where they're both have victims, that the victims want answers and the victims have grief. Um, so I'm just, uh, you know, to make the comment there that there, there are problems with that type of uh, archiving. Indeed, thank you. I, I remember I, I was in Ireland doing some oral history when, when when this happened, and the old question of trust after that event was was, um, was impossible because we couldn't um, we couldn't make sure and we couldn't argue that the, the oral history would not be published anymore, uh, and it. It connects with with digital uh, archives and digital public history archiving projects too. Like uh, for Hurricane Katrina, there was this discussion about people uh, submitting uh, documents for which they only had partial copyrights. Uh, there was this issue about Coast Guards and someone from the Coast Guard uh, submitting something online to the archives, but he didn't have the full copyrights on on the on the document because that triggered that that connected to the U.S. Coast Guard um, legal system. So the, the all archives went into trouble for, for that copyright issue. Um, so it's not only about our history, it's also about uh, archiving from people uh, and, 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 and the, the connected uh, copyright issue and legal system. So they had to hire lawyers and, 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 and so on to, uh, to, uh, to make sure they could still um, you know, make do, those uh, items and, and documents available. Yeah, that's interesting that in terms of uh, where people are asked to submit into a kind of these digital archives or public history archives uh, on the copyright issue, it adds kind of a, a, an extra fringe of work on the research team to be, you know, to have to verify and maybe authenticate um, uh, these types of documents. So uh, thanks very much. Thanks for that. Um, so, Thomas, I, I actually have a question, and it's just, um, and I, what, how do you see the potential conflicts between, um, so you talk about like being a historian working on these data sets um, and the increased sort of pressure for open data sets and, and availability of other researchers to actually look at your data sets and publish them. Um, and then the privacy, uh, keeping the privacy of the people so uh, who actually handed over um, their stories but want to keep them private. I think, I think that's a real, well, that's a question. What, what, do you what do you think about it, working as a historian with these data sets that are very um, sensitive and can maybe not be, be open to other researchers? Um, yes, I'm on you. Well, uh, I, I don't think I have one specific view on that. I guess uh, all the projects I've mentioned have different policies. Uh, for, for example, the Hurricane Memory Bank do not give access, would not give access to me uh, uh, to, to do the research on, on their data set because uh, the copyright was said it, it was only available for those specific researchers from the Hurricane Memory Bank. Um, I, I guess I guess every project is is different. I'm not that much interested in that data set of those projects. I'm more interested in, in the internal discussion about what they want to make available, how they deal with ethical issues like, like copyright or, or identity. The data set and the data, the memories are not something I'm interested in. It's more about the construction of a framework that allows more or less public participation and, and uh, what allowing public participation triggers in terms of, of, um, of impact for the data. Uh, for example, I've seen some comments on the, on the metadata and the folksonomy. Um, th their choices impact what will be collected and how they will give power or not to the people. And that's what I'm interested in. So it's less I don't think I would, I don't expect too much trouble because I will not access the private uh, data from this website. Other may, may have to, but that's, uh, that's, that's another layer of, of study for those archives. Thank you. Um, so that maybe leads us on to um, Martin's comment um, about folksonomy. Um, so Martin, do you want to um, say something about your comments? Yes, I can. Uh, uh, just, ju just I, 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 I was thinking about so our prof 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 
professional practice also. I, I, I uh, web archivist at the Hungarian na na National Library that in a, in a, in a longer term, when we have established our archive collection pro, pro per, 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 we, we, would, we, we would like, uh, like uh, to involve uh, 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 the people to uh, help to build our collection and uh, even now we we have a uh, template for this purpose that anyone can uh, suggest any kind of resource to us but but it's really hard to find this kind of necessary compromise to keep the uh, the ar the archive usable with a well uh, managed uh, uh, metadata uh, uh, set and on the other hand we we need a kind of flexibility just to let the people to suggest as as many terms uh, as you want because we we we, we, we don't know uh, previously that what kind of ideas they they had and how it fits to our in, initial metadata conception. So maybe uh, a, a solution can be that that a, a kind of a flexible semantic based uh, data set can be uh, built up with with a uh, with an automatic recommendation system that that uh, is giving ideas for 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 the users uh, uh, in 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 which text they they can use and uh, and uh, and if they are not not finding proper text they can add the new one and that then we can think about how these texts can be involved to, to the existing system but 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 it's a hot topic uh, not uh, just related to web archiving but in, in in a in a general digital library sense and and uh, also what what eve uh, told us that 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 the fragmentation is a really uh, negative phenomena in terms of uh, uh, long term digital preservation so so we 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 need a consistent uh, uh, metadata set that 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 we can manage for 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 longer term so just just that that was my note i wanted to add this discussion from uh, uh, I'm I, 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 I'm also a graduated historian so I, I can see these things from this double point of view from a historical perspective and from a library and perspective as well. Thanks. Thank you Martin. Uh, I, I agree with you. Uh, I think that the the, the the issue is the, the balance between, between consistency and flexibility. Uh, uh, well, what I'm interested in is how do projects give role to people not only in collecting, because that's been done you know, for, for, for museums, for other collections. This is not new, but in analyzing, interpreting uh, documents. So, and there are a few uh, digital public history projects that give a role to users in interpreting or doing research about documents. And I think that this discussion about flexibility and, and users sort of not controlling, but contributing to the metadata is one way of giving a role to people. Uh, if it works or not, uh, I'm not exactly sure yet. And the, the projects are still discussing about that. Because they're there, it's an ongoing project. So they're they're looking at the how it works and, and the challenge of, um, of of people choosing metadata. For example, if they say hashtag BLM or hashtag Black Lives Matters, uh, that's not exactly the same. It's not exactly the similarity with 
recognizable. So they're facing uh, many issues. But again, what I'm interested in is how they try to give an additional layer of control and, and power to people in creating the, the archives. This is what I think is very interesting. Now, if it works or not, I'm sure that they face many challenges and I'm not sure if other projects have developed similar. Uh, but but it, in, in this way, you can work together with li li librarians and libraries because because it's it's a it's a crucial when when we 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 have to create more open libraries for the the you the, the, the users it's is a it 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 is a highly crucial factor factor for us so it it, it would be nice to collaborate with you on these issues that okay thank you. <laughs> And what's just one more word? What's interesting is that they have these regular ethical meetings about uh, about those very specific issues. So that that's why I believe this project particularly is, is very useful for me because they're doing this self reflection about ethical issues in in collaboration. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yeah. Martin. Um, so the last question I can detect is from Darren. Darren. Um, it's there's a question in your comment. I, I don't know if it's a question or a comment. Would you could you elaborate on that? Hello. Yes. Um, I was just. Uh, I think it's it's sort of related to to what Niels was talking about, in that um, the way that uh, the uh, mobile devices we use and the metadata that they apply and the sort of affordances they give us, whether the, 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 the types of devices we use to connect to the internet and the, the way that they, they allow us to kind of leave our desks and go out and, and, and document the world, whether those are affecting the kind of things and the ways that we archive. And if that's something that needs to be considered. Um. Yes, thank you, Darren. Uh, yeah, again, going back to Neil's question on, on what does the digital change? Yes, uh, the, 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 the format and, and the access and the, 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 the timing of, of collecting is, is key and how social media um, collecting becomes part of, of, of archiving. We just had a, a PhD defense here at the C2DH of someone who created her own archive through uh, social media collecting. Um, and how this this um, well changes also the the, the, the document and the material she could access and, and use for to do her history. So yes, there is this old technological issue of of collecting uh, online and through digital project that has to be um, questioned in the impact. Going back to the first question, the impact of doing it digitally on on, on the archive itself. Thank you. Um, all right, thank, uh, thank you so much um, for all of your questions and the great um, responses. Um, so I think um, there are no, I, well, so I don't detect any more sort of direct questions in the chat. Um, could you please unmute me if you think I'm wrong? Otherwise, I think there are lots and lots of uh, comments. Um, and so I guess you just get the recording and the chat from, from Niels, and then you have everything to sort of, just, there are lots of links as well. So you can just go discover those um, uh, later. So um, works great with this chat. Um, and um, then I think we need to move on to, we have two other um, items uh, on the agenda. Um, so. One is um, Jason uh, will do a wrap up. Jason, Jason Weber will do a wrap up, a five minute wrap up of this um, great session. And then we have Kays and the challenge. Um, so, Jason, do you want to do the wrap up now? Um, I'm, I'm hello there. I'm really sorry. I, I actually had a, a family emergency, so I only caught the end of this discussion. So I'm not sure I'm actually very well placed to do a, a wrap up. I really apologise. I'm so sorry. That's fair enough, Jason. Uh, <clears throat> so 
I think we'll then skip the wrap up if, if that's okay, Helena, and then uh, jump to the last point you have on the agenda. Yes, okay. Um, we'll skip the wrap up then. Um, and then we have a case. Um, maybe and the maybe challenge. Uh, unless, you, unless you want to do it yourself, Helena, that, that's also a possibility. Um, yes, well. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, you know, I feel more, you know, sometimes chairing is more like a switchboard lady where you have to watch the chat and, and That's right. um, so, so I can, I, I think I can only do a wrap up of the talk actually, more the questions and comments is more like hmm. watching the you chat. Do, a, and, do as you please. Um, oh, Valérie has but, Valérie, comment, okay. <laughs> I don't want to make the wrap, the wrap up and I let uh, Elle brainstorm very fast on uh, what she can tell, but uh, First, I thank Thomas because it was so interesting and raising a lot of questions. And maybe this is also something we should continue to discuss within our WorkNet uh, group because uh, really there is there a, a challenge about the role of uh, professional archivists facing amateurism and uh, new kind of practices and this centralization of uh, computing ability to archive and so on. And perhaps, yes, just we should also eventually discuss within our group uh, our um, ability to create some public engagement. Is it something we want in work? And should we try to disseminate a bit more to the public? Of course, we are starting, but what should be in our case, in our project, the engagement with the, the public? This is something probably which is also meaningful for us. Good points, okay, Valerie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, ex excellent. And, and I think now I have a wrap up. <laughs> um, so I, I think um, two issues. Um, one is affordances, um, which is something we also talk a lot about in this working group in terms of what, you know, the affordances of different kinds of web archives, web archives across um, different um, different countries, and also for transnational comparisons. Um, but then there is it. What what is what this what is the affordances of digital archives that are different in terms of engaging with the public? Um, and so both Darren and Nils's comments sort of push you on that issue, and I think really great questions and great responses um, and definitely something to think about further but for well uh, also for the network um, and what what are the affordances and how then I think the second big, big issue would be sort of public engagement those for like the affordances could uh, and the digital specificities could mean many different things and different um, uh, in, in different direction, uh, different areas, but here it's particularly about the public engagement. What kinds of public engagements uh, engagements do they allow for, uh, and what are the impact in terms of um, the roles of archives in engaging with the public, uh, but also uh, what new roles uh, do the public have in terms of engaging with archives? Um, Sorry, this was the <laughs> a very uh, quick wrap up, but I think those two issues and then um, I think they point to what Valerie says um, in terms of for our network, um, which where we have both like, you know, archivist um, developers. So, so it's both like also soft and hard infrastructure of, of web archives, but also the uses of web archives um, as researchers. Um, what does that mean in terms of what we can do as a network? What are the affordances of this network in terms of doing that public engagement? Because we're uh, brought together by Nils from very different fields and, and that does normally maybe happen. Um, so the, so the in engagement and interaction that we can actually do here, what, what can we create that you just couldn't create on your own as a researcher or as an archive or, or as a single archive as such? Um, yeah, so, okay, um, that's it, I think, from me.